I'd like to introduce our very special guest today, the legendary Aswat Damodaran. Uh, Aswat is an award-winning professor of finance at the Stern School of Business at NYU, and he's globally recognized as the Dean of Valuations with hundreds of thousands of students tuning into his lectures on iTunes U. On top of that, Aswat has been an author of at least nine books that I'm aware of, and uh, each of them covering topics such as valuation, corporate finance, risk, investment philosophy, and even, even stories on uh, how, or even one on how stories influence value. Uh, Business Week and others have named Aswath among the top business professors and thought leaders in the United States, and his blog, Musings on Markets, which I've been enjoying for many years, was selected by Times of London as one of the top stock market blogs in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the one and only Mr. Aswath the Motorin. Aswath, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So let's, you know, where I always love to start these conversations is with uh, your, your personal story. Where, where, did you, where did you grow up? What were some of the most formative experiences and uh, perhaps even some mentors or role models along the way? Uh, tell us where you came from. I was born in India. I was born in Chennai, which is in the south of India now. And I grew up in an India very different from the India you might visit today. Now, it was an, it was an India that perhaps hadn't changed in hundreds of years, grounded very much in in family and social structure. In fact, to give you a sense of uh, the, the, the culture shock I had, I, the Chennai for much of the time that I grew up in had no TV. No, no, so it's, it's almost unthinkable for somebody to say, you grew up with no TV, I grew up with no TV. The idea of a good social gathering was the family would gather together and we had extended family would gather together in the evenings, you might listen to the radio, perhaps BBC once in a while. But to give you a sense of the culture shock, that is the India I grew up in, an India that was kind of grounded in a centuries old culture. And um, the good, there are good things and bad things about growing up in a culture like that. The good things is you develop an active imagination because you have no choice. You know, you don't get, you know, you don't have, you know, somebody else providing entertainment for you. Your mind has to provide its own. And, you know, you're always, um, you're, you're always the person that was created by the circumstances you are in. And I'm thankful for every part of my upbringing because it's made me who I am today. And, and who would be the people that influenced who you are today most? Probably my, my, my parents, my, you know, my, 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 my grandparents. I mean, it's, um, as I said, the India I grew up in, you didn't look outward. You essentially were forced to get your role models by looking at the people around you. So I had no celebrities to look up to, no social media stars, no movie stars. So it was actually look around and see who you find in the nearest you know, physical setting. So I you know much of my, much of who I am was created by, by, by the family I grew up with. And, and okay, so from those humble beginnings, you get to, to today, where as, as I mentioned here, widely regarded as the Dean of Valuations. How, how did you kind of go from those beginnings to a, understanding the value of the business, and then obviously to becoming one of the most highly regarded experts on it in the yeah. world. It's funny, nothing I've ever done has been a big plan. So when my kids talk about, you no, know, I want to have a 20-year plan, because we're all told you need to have really long-term plans. Nothing I've ever done has come from a bucket list of things I had to do. It's incremental. It's small steps at a time. I never started off saying I've got to become an expert on valuation. Incidentally, I don't like the word dean evaluation. There's actually a story behind it. It was about a decade ago, I was on CNBC and the anchor could not get my name. He tried and he tried and he tried and he said, I give up. I've got to come up with something else. I'm going to call you the dean evaluation. It's kind of stuck. So it's more because people couldn't pronounce my last name. But almost everything I've done has been incremental. So each step that I took moved me closer to some destination. The destination was never my end game. It was playing the game. So I never started off trying to be where I am. It's just incrementally I've ended up you know, at, the, at the place where I am. So you know, I, you know, I've taught my first valuation class in 1986. Nobody had ever taught a valuation class at a business school because there wasn't much there. And there wasn't much there. But I did it because I was interested in how markets set prices to companies, this process of demand and supply. So my first valuation class, I was winging it. I didn't have enough material to get through three weeks for a 15-week class. And I kept thinking, what do I do next session? 
and I've winged it through. And each semester since, everything I know about valuation, I've learned in the process of teaching valuation living through, I mean, even in my limited lifetime, I've lived through the dot-com boom, the dot-com bust, the banking crisis, the social media boom, and uh, the COVID shutdown. And each time we've gone through one of these things, I've learned something new about valuation. So my knowledge is the collective experience of having lived through past issues and having to think through them. But I think the key is you think about what you have to do and then you think about what general lessons can I draw. And that's something that's helped me all the way through kind of build up a base that I hope I can pass on to my students when I teach a class. And so just before we get to the actual topic of what drives value and valuations. um, So today you're an award-winning professor, uh, not just at NYU, but some of the other prestigious faculties you've taught at. And um, clearly it's your calling because how well you've done at it. But at the same time, somebody that masters valuations could also ostensibly go out and make billions of dollars on Wall Street. And and we talked about why you didn't want to, you know, um, separately we talked about why you didn't want to become a consultant, but why didn't you go out into Wall Street and just make, uh, create your fortunes there uh, if, if you have this edge on the valuations front? Because I'm a teacher. I mean, that's my, that's my passion. I mean, that's what I do, you know, I, and I'm lucky enough to be a teacher in a discipline where I make more than enough money to cover everything I need. I mean, nobody ever has everything they want. I have everything I need. So what would making another hundred million dollars do for me? It wouldn't change a single thing, thing about my lifestyle or how I live. And I'm incredibly happy teaching. So to me, it's it's not a question of whether I could do those things. I mean, I know the old saying of those who can do, those who cannot teach. But I value companies. I value them for my own investing. So I don't do them for theory. But I have no zero interest in being accountable to 50 clients who've given me their money and say, what have you done for me lately? You know, I even if if I I'm I'm incredibly lucky to be where I am because I can talk about valuation, I can teach valuation, I can do valuations and act on those valuations and make a more than decent living doing it. So the end game for every human being is to maximize utility, not maximize wealth. Right. I mean, it's it's always not something that we tend to forget, you know, when we get focused on how do I maximize how much money I make. So I, for me, it's, it's, ne- it's, ne- it's never even been, I mean, it's, I've never even been mildly tempted to think about a different path. And that may be the most important thing we take away from this conversation today. But um, I think if we get to the you know, topic of valuations and what drives value, um, maybe a, a good place to start is how you see it differently or perhaps the most common mistakes and misconceptions you see people around you making vis-a-vis the drivers of value or assessing value? I, I think it's not even drivers of value. They mistake what valuation is. I mean, and I think it's become worse over the last 40 years as we have access to more data and more models. In a strange way, we have more data than we've ever had in our lifetime. We have more powerful models than we've ever had in, in anybody's lifetimes. And where our valuations are actually getting worse rather than better because we've made valuation into financial modeling. You become an Excel ninja. And I think in a sense, we've lost our way. And it's part of what I've been pushing for. And one of the reasons I wrote the narrative and numbers book is we need to rediscover the truth, which is you don't, when you value a company, you value a business, you're essentially telling a story. Whether you like it or not, your numbers are telling a story. And you better make that story explicit and make sure it's a story that you can buy into before you buy based on the numbers. So to me, that's that's the biggest misconception about valuation is to do valuation, you need to understand every single detail of accounting and know how to build a big Excel spreadsheets because that's all you can do. You're not valuing companies, you're just doing financial modeling. To me, every other mistake you comes out of that misconception because you know most people value who do valuation for a living don't even realize there are drivers of valuation because if you built an Excel spreadsheet with 500 line items, you have no idea what's driving your valuation. It could be any one of those line items. They've lost sight of the forest because they're so stuck looking at individual trees. 
and and uh, I imagine it's highly idiosyncratic to the situation, but uh, when you think about value, how do you figure out what those drivers are? What those the drivers are output, they're not inputs, they come from your story. The drivers are, I mean, we know what the drivers are for value, it's not a mystery. Your business model is driven by three drivers, your revenue growth, capturing the growth part of your business, your operating margins, capturing the profitability part of your business, and some proxy for how efficiently you can deliver growth. What do you need to do? If you're a manufacturing company, you've got to build factories. If you're a tech company, you've got to invest in R&D. Revenue growth margins and that reinvestment proxy become the drivers of your cash flows, the model. And of course, if you're a safe business, I'm going to value more highly than a risky business. So the other two components capture risk. One is the risk in your operations. If you're a risky business, I'm going to demand a higher return to invest in you and attach a lower value. If you're a safer business, I, I go in the other direction. And also the chance you will not make it, which is, let's face it, if you're a young startup, two thirds of young startups don't make it a failure. rate. So those five inputs are the drivers of value hmm. we, for every company. That the question is, what will those drivers look like for your company? If you're an oil company today, and I look at those drivers, your revenue growth, there's not much left. I mean, fossil fuels are, uh, are going to eventually go away. You're in a business where climate change is going to be a constant threat to your growth. I'm not going to value an oil company with 50% revenue growth, no matter how upbeat I fail about oil prices in the near term. Your margins are pretty stagnant. They're good, but they're stagnant. What are you going to do? Cut costs? I mean, in what, in what form? And your reinvestment is very little because you've got your reserves already. You're just going to develop those reserves. So in a sense, if you're an oil company, the story you're telling is a boring story, but it's a story reflecting where you are in a business. I'm a great believer that it's, this is not, you know, you're not writing fairy tales. You can't take a brick and mortar retail company like Bed Bath and Beyond and give it an uplifting story. It's more likely to be a horror story than an uplifting story. Not because you want you like telling horror stories, but where's the where's the good way the story can end? Right. And so in a sense, you got to tell stories that reflect the business you're valuing. Sometimes it's uplifting, sometimes it's boring, sometimes it's you know, it's like a walking dead company. There's nothing good that can emerge from the story. Once you tell the story though, in that story are the clues to what kind of rev drivers you will see for the company. For an oil company, it will be low to negative growth, stable margins, not much reinvestment because that's what the story tells me to do. If you ask me to value a um, young electric car company, I might have high growth the margins are still kind of being figured out. Is this more like a technology company, in which case margins can be higher, a manufacturing company? That's going to be part of your story. So depending on the company you're looking at, your story can give you very different drivers. The drivers, once you've got the drivers, the value kind of does itself, right? It's just mechanical. How do you, I mean, you, you've, you've also written and lectured about sort of this dark side evaluation, particularly where it comes to companies that where those, you know, the the revenue side, the margin side, all of those 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 factors are hard to assess um, in terms of the, in companies like startups or venture companies are highly speculative assets mm -hmm. or distressed assets. So what what should investors keep in mind when thinking about valuing assets like these? And what are some of the common mistakes that you see when valuing? sport, crypto, venture, sports franchises, whatever it may be? Well, two things. One is you can do, all you can do is take what you know now and frame it as a story, right? Based on the data. So you have to do, and uh, that's the first thing. Second is most of what you're saying is out of your control, which is things will happen that you don't control. There are the world, the way the world will live. And third, you're going to be wrong 100% of the time in hindsight, Okay. right? Which is, but that's okay. You don't have to be right to make money. You just have to be less wrong than everybody else. The reason I value companies where people are most uncertain is I believe that markets make their biggest mistakes when uncertainty is greatest. So you want to go where it's darkest because that's because you make money, not you know, nobody gives you gold stars because your value was precise. If everybody else can value this company precisely, hey, what's so special about you? 
-hmm. This is not about earning gold stars or pats on the back because your value came in close to something that other people thought it should come in at. It comes from finding a market mistake and making money when the market corrects its mistakes. From that perspective, you want to go where it's most uncertain. You want to make your best judgment. You want to do it. You have to do it with, with humility, knowing that you're going to be wrong all of the time. But it also means that you can go back and revisit your valuation and say, I got that wrong. I'm going to tell a different story. The three most freeing words in investing are, I was wrong. Because until you say those, you can't go take another look at your story. You, I mean, you can't fall in love with your story and say, I'm going to hold on to it no matter what. In fact, you know, people don't understand it, which is one reason I don't like the word conviction, is, which a lot of value investors use, is conviction often means is I have a story, I've told the story, and I'm going to stick with that story no matter what. Hmm. That's a very dangerous place to be in a world that's changing under you. I have no qualms about changing my story and looking back and saying, I should have done that differently. I don't regret what I did because I did the best I could when I valued Uber in 2013 and 2015. So I'm going to learn from my mistakes, but I'm not going to sit there beating myself and well, I should have seen COVID coming in 2019. I didn't, but nobody did. Yeah. So what's my point? What's the point of looking back at a Zoom valuation? I did. I actually valued Zoom on February 12th of 2020. Complete coincidence. And somebody asked me nine months later, well, why didn't you build in the growth that came from COVID? And I said, on February 12, 2020, I didn't know COVID was going to hit. You cannot bring in the benefit of hindsight and reassess everything you do and regret what you did based on what you knew then. For sure. For sure. And so, I mean, that that really does speak to the kind of to the risk side of that, you know, valuation model. And um it's risk seems to be a topic that's frequently misunderstood. How do you, how do you think about it, and what do others get wrong about it? How would you measure the risk? In, in, uh, in I, I think people think of risk as a bad thing, something to be avoided. In fact, the essence of risk management is often buying protection against risk, right? Buying insurance. Sure. Risk is neither good nor bad. It's part of life. Be glad that the risks you face are that your portfolio will drop 20%. Because if you're a cave person, when you first learn, you know what risks look like, right? That you went out hunting and you didn't make it back because a mammoth mowed you down. Yeah. We've always lived with risk. For much of human existence, that risk was physical. Which is, if you didn't take risk, you did not eat. In other words, you could say, look, I'm not going to go out to hunt. I might get killed, but then you had nothing to eat. It was only about 700 or 800 years ago that we started separating physical risk from financial risk. I mean, the original basis, I think, is when those people, wealthy people, were able to buy a ship, you know, in, in London, put sailors on it, send it around the Cape, Cape or, you know, around, the, around Africa, all the way to Asia, knowing fully well that only four out of every seven ships that were sent out made it back. The sailors took the physical risk. They were paid rock bottom wages. The ship owners got the financial risk and they diversified. So the only thing is risk has always been part of life. So you can't, you can't make it go away. You can't wish it away. It's not something you can research away. It is part of life, which means that all you can do is look it in the face and ask yourself, am I comfortable taking the risk that I'm taking? And if you are, recognize that this will mean that there will be unpredictable things that happen to your portfolio. And you have to be, you have to be able to live with those unpredictable things, which is one reason you don't want to overreach on risk. You don't want to take on risk because everybody around you is taking on risk. You want to take on risk because it's your choice. I have a very simple test in investing. It's called the sleep test. And here's how it goes. If you lie awake at night wondering how your portfolio is doing, you've already failed the sleep test. All it is is a signal that you've taken on more risk than you should. So to me, risk is, is just a presence. It's something I acknowledge. I don't hide from it. I don't go into denial about it. I've got to face up to it, demand a reasonable return to cover that risk, and then do the best I can to not expose myself to unnecessary risk. 
so maybe if we could talk a little bit more, and I, I think I, I love that evolution from physical risk to financial risk, and I guess now um, that we're dealing with sort of liquid traded markets, there's also the behavioral and psychological slash emotional risk. All, they all show up as either, they, they show up as physical or financial risk, right? They, the sources of this risk can be any of those. And it's it so can how be you manage, how, how, do you, how do you manage, like it, it, in terms of, uh, the ability to manage those risks. Again, in your view, uh, what is the optimal way for investors to think about it practically? And then from your view as, as a practitioner of, of valuing assets and valuing those risks, how do you think about it? Well, I think you've got to bring in perspective, right? Often our assessments of risk are based on what's happened most recently. This is why in really good times, we act like risk has gone away. In 1999, there were people saying there will never be a recession again. Why? Because they hadn't seen one in nine years. In 2020, there were people saying inflation will never be bad. Technology has solved the inflation problem. You need perspective. Now, I look at history, not because I want to get stuck in history, but because history does give you perspective. So I think that, you know, it's when you think about risk, you've got to maintain perspective, which is there are risks that are always going to be around. The fact that they haven't been around for a little while, and a little while can be seven years, eight years, or 10 years, doesn't mean they've gone away. So sometimes it's just perspective. It's one of the few advantages that older people have over younger people, hopefully, is um, I remember when inflation, I started in markets in 1980. I remember the Volcker years. And that's why in 2021, at the start of 2021, when I heard people saying, what's the big deal about inflation? The Fed can control it. My reaction was, hey, be very careful because inflation is not something you mess with. It's like a genie in a bottle. If you let it out, nobody can control it. Not the Fed, not the government, not any macroeconomic power because it takes over the conversation. So sometimes with risk, it's just stepping back and saying, we've been in really good times. That doesn't mean risk has gone away. I still have to think with that long-term perspective. I still have to invest on the recognition that this too shall pass, that there will be recessions, that inflation could come back. So sometimes risk, you know, getting a, a sensible read on risk often just means having the perspective of looking across history and saying, you know, I've got to invest on the assumption that bad things haven't happened for a long time, but that doesn't mean that they will never happen again. Yeah, and I think I think inflation is a great example of that. And I mean, you've said before that inflation is the risk to be paying attention today. You've just said it. You know, the genie is out of the bottle. Um, could you just help us understand that in a world where inflation is kind of the central, as I think you put it, the elephant in the room? How should one think about it from an asset allocation point of view? Um, uh, and, I think and maybe, the, uh, sorry, so just, maybe just yeah. before you do that, could you also help elaborate for somebody who's not as familiar, help uh, just uh, art articulate the ways in which inflation influences valuations and, uh, and so on. And then- uh, I mean, the, the first effect is a very direct effect. When inflation is 8%, you need to make at least 8% just to cover inflation. Which means even if you're investing in something riskless and guaranteed, you're going to say, look, I, I'm seeing inflation of 8%. I need to make 8% plus. So the first thing that's going to happen is if inflation is 8%, you can kiss goodbye to T-bond rates of 2% or 3%. You're looking at you know, even guaranteed rates of 8 9 And if you start with that rate and you build up from that, because to take on risk, I got to give a premium you need to make 15% on stocks if the risk-free rate is 10%. To make a 15% return on stocks, you can't pay more than five or six times earnings. The ripple effects of our inflation means every financial asset has to get priced down to deliver a higher return for you. That's a direct effect. Right. But if that were the only effect, inflation wouldn't be as damaging as it is. The real problem with inflation is it's corrosive. It changes the way we all behave. I mean, just think about each of you probably, many of you probably drove in to work today. And you probably start, I mean, along the way, you might have had to stop at a gas station and fill up your gas. Where I am, it's $6. You know, it changes where you go to shop. It changes the car you buy. It might change, you know, whether you turn on the air conditioning or not, because you're worried about hey, what do fuel prices look like. Inflation changes behavior. It's not just for individuals, but for businesses. 
So when you think about inflation's effect, it's not just higher discount rates. It means businesses stop investing long term. In high inflation environments, would you want as a business to build a factory that has a 30-year life? I wouldn't because I have too much uncertainty about what the future will bring, whether I can keep up with inflation. Everybody becomes, every business becomes a bank during inflation because you make more money by just borrowing money and lending it out than by building factories, building toll roads, putting money into R&D. So what inflation does is it's not just a, an effect of higher required returns, which translates into a lower value. It could affect your revenue growth, your margins. It eats away at an economy from the inside. And that's why when inflation becomes high and unstable, the economy kind of loses its moorings. Nothing healthy happens when inflation becomes really high and really unstable. I mean, all you have to do is visit Venezuela to see what the end game looks like when inflation becomes this number you don't even want to look at anymore. I mean, you essentially lose faith in everything, every institution. Now, that's why hyperinflation has always been followed by political unrest. Because you okay. lose faith in institutions, you open the door to all kinds of troubling developments when people don't have any faith in traditional institutions. But uh, also, isn't, and, and again, please feel free to correct yeah. my ignorance here, but isn't a, a lot of the situations of hyperinflation really a function of uh, lack of sort of fiscal discipline and money? Like principle? spending $5 trillion in two years? Co correct. Te yeah. Technically, um, but at even greater levels on a relative basis. Well, five but trillion is, is 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 how much higher than five trillion would we have to go to be undisciplined? The the sense that I have, and again, feel free yeah. to correct me, is right now the issue, the inflation we're experiencing, is largely a supply driven inflation. Yeah, that's and, what they've been saying since. If it were supply driven, you wouldn't have the panic that you do because supply driven inflation always ends. So you know, early 2021, that was the story, right? It was COVID, then it was supply chains, and it was Russia. At some point in time, you run out of excuses. <laughs> we, we're, we're, we're past that time. Even Janet Yellen and Jerome Powell have finally come around from their delusions and accepted that this isn't a supply-driven number anymore. Part of it is, but a big chunk of it is not. I mean, so, you know, if you could spend money without consequences, we'd have three trillion dollar packages every year. Just send three thousand dollar checks to everybody. There's a reason historically we've not done this. I mean, I can understand the political motivations for what the Congress did in 2020 and 2021, but there's no way you can tell me it doesn't come with consequences. No, absolutely. This is, this is the hangover effect. Absolutely. How bad and how long will depend on you know. What inflation I, decides to do. So I guess the, the the question that I'd have, and again, the, the way I was reasoning it was, yes, $5 trillion went to the system. And that was really, I mean, you- It didn't go into the system. It went to people who didn't, a lot of it went to people who didn't need it. Right? $1,800 checks to everybody. It was completely unfocused. No. That's true. No, I, I would say out of the $5 trillion, I'd be surprised more than 40% made it to the people who needed it. Much of it, was just money thrown into the system at people who didn't need it. Like my son who was, you know, was a college student who got an $1,800 check because he'd filed a tax return. For what? Now what, you know, and that's, that's what it is. It's not just the amount of money, but the way it came into the economy, I think made it particularly, it's like throwing fuel on it. The, the first package you could have said, we had no choice, we were panicked. The second was a completely self-inflicted wound. The, because that you could say by then the economy was already well on its way to finding its feet. The second so you, package, you, I can't think of a good, I can't think of anything other than the, the only description I think you threw fuel on a fire and then you're, you're claiming it's getting too hot. Well, no, this is exactly what happens. So as you look forward and, and whether it's a function of increased money supply, whether it's a combination of that along with uh, increased regulation, deglobalization, supply chain, whatever. Um, bottom line is it's here. When you're thinking about it, how does that, how did, first of all, do you have a range in your mind for- or No, I'll give you the problem? range right now. The, the inflation in the last decade was 1.7%. The actual inflation numbers coming in now are eight, nine, 
Now, some of that eight, nine, ten percent is supply chain. It's COVID related. It's going to go away. So we're going to end up somewhere between one point seven and nine percent. The question is where. Until we get to a steady state on that, we're going to have days like today in the market and days like yesterday and what happened last week. Because here's where we are. The expected inflation markets are building in now is about 3%. That's gone up from 1% two years ago down to up to 3%. But if we're actually heading towards 5% as a steady state, now lower than the 9% you're seeing now, there's a heck of a lot of pain in front of us. If we're heading down towards three or three and a half percent, much of the pain is behind us. This entire market, the big question we're asking is, actual and expected inflation are different now. They have to converge for the market to get into steady state. Where is that convergence going to be? Is it going to be closer to the eight or is it going to be closer to 1.7? And that really will determine when this pain will start to subside and you can move on to other things on the table, other drivers of, of value. Because right now, that is the only question markets care about. And with the Fed you know, raising rates as they have yesterday and have throughout that, that, that tool and your views on that tool's ability there, to- bring Yeah, there are two ways you can make the numbers converge. One is you can let market expectations keep rising to meet actual inflation, right? The other is you can try to bring actual inflation down by reducing demand. That's a nice way of saying you put the economy into a recession, the deeper the recession, the less money people have, the less money people have, the less they will buy, the less they will buy. So we're in a, between a rock and a hard place. We let expected inflation just keep rising. We're gonna end up with seven, 8% inflation in a world full of high and unstable inflation, which is painful. But the alternative is you put the economy into recession. The Fed is just chasing market rates. The Fed is not raising rates. Rates rose and the Fed is now responding to that rate rise in markets. What the Fed is essentially trying to do is slow the engine down enough that actual inflation, because convergence is what they're looking for too. And they're trying to do it by bringing actual inflation down. But along the way, you're gonna have millions of people lose their jobs and pain inflicted on the people who are least protected against that pain, which is the way it always works out. So unfortunately, there is no third choice or less pain. There was a year and a half ago. That is the advantage you'd have gained by acting early. There is none anymore. At this point, the Fed has been forced to act and we'll have to see how quickly they can bring actual inflation down because you got to keep your foot on the brakes, even as pain mounts. And that's politically very difficult for any central bank to do. Hmm. So we'll see how much, whether Jerome Powell is the second coming of Arthur Bunch <laughs> and, or whether okay. he's the next, you know, next version of Paul Volcker. And that's, I mean, I'm, I'm not being facetious. He, he really has, you know, this is going to be the test of how much political strength he has to push up because he's going to come in under incredible pressure as unemployment rates start to go up and the election gets closer. We're going to see which way he's going to go. And, and also, like, I, I think that obviously we can't control what the Fed does. We can't control what the impacts of that will, will be. What we can't control is our asset allocation. So obviously you're an investor and you've written a book. There's on no place to go. There's no safe place to go. Basically, you got to accept that your portfolio is going to get marked down and how much, the question is how much, not whether. And I think the, uh, the, what you can do is you can buy some protection in real assets. It used to be gold and real estate. Gold is still there, but you can't put 50% of your money in gold. It's a non-productive asset. You can put five, 10%, maybe collectibles. This might be a good time to add to your, you know, if you have always wanted a Picasso and you're wealthy enough to afford one, go buy one. If you can't afford a Picasso, find a nice up and coming, but do it only because you enjoy the art, not because you're doing it as an investment. You can, you know, it's, um, it's, you can add collectibles. You can, you know, real estate is, is the big question mark because in the 70s real estate was the only asset class that held its own outside of gold that held its own against inflation but if you think about the classic real estate investment in the 70s it was a rental property 
you bought a house or an apartment, you rented it out. And the reason it was relatively immune against inflation is you raised rents as inflation went, you passed inflation through. We've, we might have ruined real estate as an asset class based on what we've done over the last 40 years, but because by securitizing real estate, we made it behave more like stocks and bonds. So the big question mark hanging over the next few years is, will putting your money into real estate protect you against inflation? I don't think it will to the extent it in the 70s, but if you're gonna put your money into real estate, don't buy REITs or MLPs buy a nice rental property and probably, but you might have to wait a few months and wait for a price correction because yeah. they've all been yeah. pushed up as well. But right. I think you might have to think of your asset allocation as moving away from financial assets into real assets because financial assets collectively, inflation being higher than expected has never been a good thing. There's no safe place. But within stocks, you want to buy companies with pricing power because they, they come out companies with high gross margins because a lot of cost inputs expose you to inflation companies mm -hmm. with short investment cycles you know you don't want to, you want to avoid companies that need to invest for 30 40 years infrastructure companies for instance and companies that are relatively safe that are already generating cash flows have low debt because those companies they're still going to be hurt but not by as much as the rest of the market right. and what about i mean i think what we've seen is certainly the entire speculative class of asset classes, uh, NFTs, cryptos, memes. Those are not assets. They're, they're, they're in, let's call them what they are, right? They're speculative alternatives. And um, they have no, you know, they, if, you, if you're going to buy, and, and the argument that, that was made is that, you know, I describe Bitcoin as millennial gold, <laughs> which is you held on to it because you thought somehow if people lost trust, they'd come to Bitcoin. But you got to learn your lessons. Remember, you can't get stuck to a story. And what we're discovering is Bitcoin is not behaving like gold. It's behaving like very risky stock, uh, yeah, which raises absolutely. an interesting question. Then if it's not a good currency and it's never been a good currency, you know, how many people actually use Bitcoin to buy their food, buy, you know, rent their car? Yeah. It's not been a good currency and it's not a good collectible. What the heck are you paying $20,000 for? Is it more, maybe it's a bean, it's in, in, in the, I wrote a post about seven years ago where I said millennial gold or millennial beanie babies, because in a sense, you don't know which pathway and Bitcoin, the way it's going, if it doesn't have standing as a collectible and it doesn't get used as a currency, could very quickly test its lower bound, which is zero. And putting aside speculative non-productive assets like NFTs and cryptos and so on, when you're thinking about high growth sort of call it growth equity or, or late stage venture, which are growing at a higher hurdle than that 8% rate of inflation. Uh, would it not be opportunistic based on that premise to start looking at some of those uh, growth equity, high growth? No, because the expected growth rate is higher than that number. It's not an actual growth rate. In fact, those companies will be more exposed because you're very much of, you know, that growth is very much a function of their pricing power and their capacity to keep selling more units. We're gonna find out how discretionary a Netflix subscription is. Hmm. We're gonna find out that many of these, I mean, remember many of these big, big companies that have been built around platforms have never been tested by recession. Uber hasn't, no, Netflix hasn't. We're gonna find out how hmm. discretionary taking an Uber riders. We're gonna find out how discretionary online advertising is. So in a sense, this is going to be a test of the laws of economics as to whether these companies, so all these growth numbers are built on a story of being able to sell more subscription, charge higher prices, but all, as I said, inflation in a sense can put a stake through the heart of each of those stories because it might turn out that nobody wants to be in your platform and pay $10 a month if they're having trouble keeping their jobs. Yeah. And and just, uh, I know this is maybe a little bit off target, but just as you're seeing the labor market uh, today, on the one hand, we have, you know, just unprecedented, well, I shouldn't say unprecedented, inflation that we haven't seen in many years. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the labor market is still fairly robust. Uh, how do you see the interplay of those two things? Huh? Uh, 
It, it, there's a lag defect, right? I mean, in a sense, consumer confidence drops, people stop buying. You know, so if the economy slows, it's not going to see it overnight. It's not like people start to lay off. You know, It takes a while for it to roll through. I think the first thing that's going to happen is we've had a period where people just quit their jobs in the spur of the moment. They do it for this, you know, for reasons that are actually very, you know, at, at first sight, at least not that critical. I'm not coming in because you're making me come in three days a week and I want to come in only two days a week and I'm quitting. And the reason you do it because you know you can find another job. So first thing you're probably going to find is if you quit a job today, you might find, I mean, six months ago or a year ago, you might have had no trouble finding another job. Now you might have to find yourself waiting weeks for a callback. Mm -hmm. You put your house in the market six months ago, it was snapped up even before you put it up. There were multiple bids. Already you start to see it. So it takes a while for this to play through. And I think that you're going to see if there's a slowing, you're going to start to see it in the, you know, in consumer purchases first, then you're going to see layoffs, and then you're going to see unemployment creep up, and then you're going to find people starting to pull back. But it's going to, you know, it's going to come, you know, it's going to happen, and it might happen over three months or four months, but you're going to see it over the summer, I think you're going to see the first Roll, rolling effects of this slowing. And that's what we've seen in the past for sure. I guess the question that I would pose to you is those that provide a counterpoint are saying, you know what, the just demographics are destiny. The demographics are such where the baby boomers are all retiring and the productive class is small. So the labor issue is not going to go away. And so we have a bigger problem than we realize. And it means the pain is going to be even longer, even more. Now, it's a good thing when you have layoffs. I know it's not good for the people who are laid off. It's a good thing when things happen quickly because mm. then the pain gets behind you. Okay. What you might be describing is a scenario where you have a long recession. That I mean, remember, in the 70s, the first recession to the 70s, which is long term. It's just You never came out of the recession completely. Mm. If, in fact, the labor market is stubborn and you don't see layoffs happen, you might actually see it show up as salaries being frozen, shrunk initially because, you know, you know. but it'll, it'll actually, it's actually worse for the economy if that is the case, because that'll mean you're going to get the pain spread out over years rather than months before you get the cleaning up because the cleaning up has to happen one way or the other, no matter what workers think about their jobs. And um, it's ultimately going, I mean, that's why, you know, that goes back to the point I made earlier. Inflation, once it's in the arena, everything else becomes secondary. Hmm. And, and sidestepping, um, you know, labor, um, how, how do you, how do uh, geopolitics or some of the social issues influence your views on, on asset prices or portfolio managed? Like has the world changed uh, dramatically since the last crisis in a way that actually matters? No, I think kind of, kind of risk is always there. I mean, the fact, you know, the it's risk, if you go back over the last 15 years, every year we've had a crisis rolling through. The difference is when you have a crisis with a country involving a country that has the second largest arsenal of nuclear weapons in the world, you've opened up at least this door to a catastrophic risk, a risk where it doesn't really matter what happens to your portfolio because it could be, I think that is what makes this particular, it's not, you know, countries invade each other all the time. We have geopolitical crises all the time, but the problem with the Russia-Ukraine crisis is you're concerned about what could potentially play out in at least this very small probability right now of a catastrophic scenario. Because that could really, I mean, th that's the scenario that is terrifying. And you hope it's the property is so small that you can ignore it, but it's now in the open. You've had a, just a, coming back, I mean, I think you mentioned uh, um, some of the environmental concerns. I've, I've heard some fairly fascinating and arguably contrarian views of yours on ESG. Can, maybe could I ask you just to share uh, with us. Are they even how? contrary? When I started, they were contrarian. Now my <laughs> very well become become the convention. And I started in 2019 or 2020, 2020 when I wrote the first ESG paper. I wrote it because everybody seemed to have bought into this. This was the next magical thing. And I said, I don't get it. 
how can being good cause no inconvenience? How can being good make you better off? Because that seemed to be the story that was sold. You can be good and you can be richer. You can be good and be more valuable. You can be good and earn higher returns because if you think of humanity's existence, being good has always been the more difficult path. Being good has meant inconvenience. Because if being good were easy, we wouldn't need the Ten Commandments. We wouldn't need, we wouldn't need religions. We'd all be good. Being good has always been the more difficult option. So to me, the sales pitch that ESG was making rung false. It just did not sound right. So I said, I'm going to take a look because supposedly they're doing this with a lot of research backing them up. Mm -hmm. So I took a look at the ESG research and I was uh, worse than unimpressed. I was, um, I, it, was, it was some of the worst research I've seen in any area of academia. It's really people with agendas writing things because I wanted them to be true. true. So my first pushback was, how can this be right? How can you be telling me that ESG is good for value without specifics? So when I wrote, wrote about it in 2020, I had a four blank reason for why I think ESG didn't make sense. First, I said, how did you come up with a consensus measure of goodness? Through history, this is always something we've never been able to do. You walk around your neighborhood, you ask each of your neighbors, what would a good person look like to you? My guess is you're going to get 25 different answers because we come in with very different experiences, different backgrounds. What you define as good and what I define as good are different. So how does Morning Star or Sustain Analytics or S&P somehow come up with this magical proxy where they say, we can tell you what good is and pass it. You, goodness is not a global measure. It's a personal measure. That was my first prompt. So you sure. can't measure it. How the heck can you build an entire discipline? Second, I said, okay, if goodness is going to be good for value, where does it show up as higher growth, higher margins, lower risk, and in every single dimension? I looked at the research and I said, there's no evidence that good companies grow faster. There's no evidence that good companies have higher margins. There's no evidence. In fact, if, if anything, the only evidence was that was to not be bad. If you're a really bad company, walk too close to the line, of course you can increase catastrophic risk. Then I looked at investing and I started with something I was taught in my first operations research class, which is a constrained optimal can never deliver a better outcome than an unconstrained optimal. And you don't need an OR class for this. You put in a constraint on an optimization. You can't tell me that the results you get will be better than the results without that constraint, which is what the ESG people seem to be claiming. They said, you can add a constraint on what stocks you buy in and end up with higher returns. And I said, mathematically, it doesn't make sense. But then they pointed to all this research and how well it had worked over the last decade. And it took a look at the research and it turned out that almost all of the money that ESG funds claim to make came from an unholy bet on tech companies. And why did they buy tech companies? Because they had small carbon footprints. So you were buying the Facebooks, the Googles, the, you know, every tech company. And so you were riding the tech dragon out there and saying, look, you know, the ESG funds. How quickly that, and in 2020, when I wrote about it, I said, what are you going to do? Fossil fuel stocks come back. It was a pure hypothetical. And of course, two years later, you're getting that. And finally, and this I think is the biggest pushback I would have, the argument that many ESG people made was, so what if it's not good for value? So what if it's not good for returns? It's good for society. I said, really? In what way? Oh, you know, we've reduced, you know, they gave the example of engine one at Exxon Mobil. That engine one was able to stop Exxon Mobil from expanding its fossil fuel footprint. I said, what did they do? They managed to get Exxon Mobil to sell their fossil fuel reserves. And I said, sell. So somebody must have bought them, right? You ever find out who it was? It turned out to be a private equity group. One point private equity groups have invested 1.2 trillion hmm. in fossil fuel reserves in the last decade. You know what you've done? You managed to take those reserves out of the hands of Exxon, where you could have had some control over how they were developed. And you put them in the hands of some of the least scrupulous people on the face of the earth. This is like prohibition. You stop people from drinking and you allow the mafia to build a business around speakeasies. You're not making the problem go away. You're just pushing it behind the curtain. You're making it worse rather than better. So in every single measure, I said, it doesn't make sense. No, that's why I labeled it a scam. 
a feel-good scam that makes a lot of people wealthy while making society worse off. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> I think it would, anybody listening to this that's uh, sort of an ESG activist, you know, and being... <laughs> hey, if, you're in, if, if you're in the ESG they, space, you're, you're, you're one of two, you're in fall into one of two groups and you're not going to like this because it's going to suck. You're either a useful idiot, <laughs> which means you're doing this for goodness sake, you're doing it to save the world, you're a useful idiot, or you're a feckless knave which is you're doing it because you can make money off this nice sounding concept. Larry Fink, feckless name, feckless name. Yeah. And now I, I, Morningstar sustain analytic groups. The more I, li, more I read what they write, the more I'm convinced that this is a group of feckless names, but a lot of yeah. useful idiots in the space too. Yeah, I mean, there's no question. I think there are many people who have what to gain. Do you envision a scenario where ESG will actually be harmonized into something simpler, something more basic, and something that actually is has um, empirical data to support it. Uh, is there? I mean, you, you talked about sort of an artificial constraint. I mean, you know, profitability is a it's not an artificial. It's a real constraint, and real constraints cost you. That's all I'm saying. Constraints cost you. They can't benefit you. Uh, so start with that acceptance, right? That, unless it's a constraint that actually demonstrates no, sustainability. Constraints always cost you. you can, there's no unless, there's no but, uh, but a constraint always costs you. You're doing it because you get some, some conscience benefits mm -hmm. from doing it. No. So constraints always following the Ten Commandments costs you. Hmm. But you're doing it because you want to be a good person. You're so, not doing it because you know you you expect to make more money or have a higher income because you follow it. So first, you don't fall into this ESG sales pitch that until they came along, virtue hadn't been invented. That's I mean, do you think people haven't invested their conscience before ESG came along? I mean, you know, heard of you know what Islamic finance for hundreds of years has always been around, which is if you're a religious Muslim. Islamic finance tells you what companies you should invest in. It's been around for as long as Islam has been on the face of the earth, 1400 years. Anadomini was a fund that was created, I think in the 1980s for religious Catholics. So you want to be a religious Catholic, Anadomini will invest in companies that follow Catholic church edicts. Right. This, you know, virtue has always been around. It's a, it, and this is the problem with the ESG space. They, they, these are the most sanctimonious arrogant people I've ever run into because they act like until they showed up, who are these barbarians going around maximizing how much money we made? We never, you know, we never gave our conscience a second thought. No, it's, it's absurd. It's absurd to the point where you have to say, what planet are you guys living in that you all hang out with each other thinking you invented virtue? I'm not arguing that you shouldn't bring in ethics and virtue and conscience into investing, but it's got to be your virtue, your conscience, not S&P or sustained yeah. analytics. So if you ask me, is there any hope for this concept? The only, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, the only acronym I want to see attached to ESC is RIP. <laughs> this is a concept that needs to be buried and never seen again. And so, <laughs> and, but, Putting aside ESG for a moment, I mean, you have written, and obviously, uh, in on the topic of delusion and then self-delusional stories investors tell themselves. I think you wrote a book called Investment Fables. Um, when you look out, besides ESG, when you look out into the market today, anything else that you are seeing um, unique as a sort of fables or delusions or self-delusional stories? Mm, that there's investors... always the big market delusion, which is if you buy a company that's in a big and growing market, you're going to make money. Kathy Wood has created an entire portfolio around this concept, right? I mean, Kathy is great at telling big stories, but every single one of the companies in the ARC portfolio is a company that will benefit from the big story. The problem is you can be a company in a big market that's growing and end up not making money. I gain perspective comes from being old. I remember yeah. the 1980s, the PC business taking off. So in 81, 82, people saying, this is going to be a big growing business. You know what? They were right. But of all the PC companies that were around in 81 and 82, maybe two made it through to the other end. Right. No. So I think that's a big market delusion. And I see it played out with 
AI, with cloud, with, with um, electric cars, you're seeing it play out in market, market, market. The other is this notion of a platform, which is every company is now fallen in love with, I can create a platform of users, a platform of subscribers. You can have a platform of millions of people that can be worth nothing. And you can have a platform of a few hundred thousand that's worth a lot. And it all depends on one word, stickiness, which is how sticky is your platform? I can get, get, create a platform with hundreds of millions of users if I keep giving away $20 to every user every month. It's yeah. going to be an incredibly expensive platform for me to maintain. But getting a sticky platform is of value because then, you know, that's why Facebook is a valuable company. It's not just they have 3 billion users, but 3 billion users, no matter how much they complain about privacy being invaded, get on every day and let Facebook invade their privacy by revealing more of their private lives. Sure. It's a sticky platform. So I think, again, these delusions get new words or new forms in every generation, but no, they, it's a return to the base of, I have a big story to tell, but I don't want to flesh out the details for this company. And that's why I'm so intent on telling company-specific stories. So if you want to benefit from a big market, I'm willing to listen, but tell me why this company, what makes this company, the company that's going to benefit from the electric car business booming? or the cloud computing business group. So that's my, that would be, you know, those would be the delusion, the platform delusion, the big market delusion have driven markets now for the last decade, but all delusions end. And when they end, you often have this never again, but my response is don't ever say those words never again, because I know you're going to do it again in 10 years, <laughs> but it won't take exactly the same words that you used to justify it. Yeah. So now I know I know we're running out of time. First of all, thank you. That was great. I, uh, I since we're running out of time, I'm going to try to squeeze in one last question, and I'm going to actually try to get in two questions in this last one. So number one is, what was the uh, best piece of advice or wisdom that anyone ever imparted on you? And number two, if you could leave the investors on this call with one piece of of uh, advice or wisdom, what would you uh, what would you put forward? Yeah. I, th I think the, the, the one piece of advice I've got is never regret something you've done in the past. No matter, you know, you look back and say, I wish I hadn't sold. I mean, if, if in the investment or very precisely, if you say, look, I saw, I, for instance, I bought Tesla in June of 2019. I made, it went up fivefold. I sold it in January, 2020. And guess what it did after I sold it? It went up another fivefold. I don't look back and say, I wish I hadn't done that because I've discovered that regret can be a very, very corrosive because it can affect the way you invest from this day on. You tend to hold on to things too long because you regret something you did in the past. So I've learned to look at my mistakes, learn from them and then put them away and kind of move on. And it, you know, it, it doesn't come naturally as human beings, we hold on to past mistakes. You know, the sunk cost phenomenon is alive and well in the human psyche. So I would say, let things go. I mean, sometimes letting things go, whether they're good things or bad things and say, look, here's where I am. Here's the best I can do today. The rest is out of my control. I think that's a healthy place to live life, live, you know, do investing. And I think, you know, if you can get to that place, you know, all the more power to you. Yeah, well... It's a great place to end it. Aswat, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today and sharing your incredible insights and wisdom with us and being so generous with your time. Thank you. We really appreciate it.